So hi, everybody. How are you? Um, I'm talking to you from North Carolina. So uh, as Ted knows, uh, as we were arranging it, it's, it's almost my bedtime, but I'll stay awake uh, for you guys uh, a little bit longer here tonight. So anyways, um, we're here to talk about Power BI architecture. And by that, I mean the components of a Power BI solution end to end. From an agenda perspective, here's where we're planning to go this evening. I'm going to start with um, a super short section on authoring tools and data storage modes, uh, which are some very, very important decisions you need to make. Then we're going to spend some time about how might you deliver the content. And there's three main ways um, that we're going to just walk through the main reasons why you might choose that delivery mode. And then we're gonna wrap up the, the final piece with just a quick overview of a few of the other most important components that you might have and kind of just what they are, why they're important. If you would like to grab a copy of these slides, um, they're on my website right now. Um, so Coats Data Strategies is my company. I work for me, myself and I, um, and I spend uh, all of my time right now devoted to things like Power BI deployment, governance, administration, that sort of thing. Um, and so um, to that end, since they were uh, chatting about the, the past summit earlier, I will mention that I'm doing a, a session um, on Power BI governance and also a full day pre-con on that as well. And you can find info on that on my website if you're at all interested. Um, I'm also going to show you a diagram here in just a moment, and that's also available uh, on my website. Now, um, as they mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat window of me, and I'll stop every so often and check and see um, what is there. I've also got a few questions for you. So if you'll play along and go to um, the, the website shown here, it's pollev.com, which is just a service called Poll Everywhere. Um, and then with the slash M coats 224 at the end, if you'll just fire up a browser window for me now. And what I want to do is try this out with our first question. And that URL, if you didn't quite grab it, is right at the top still. Um, with regard to your job, what's your main focus? Like, where do you usually spend your time, regardless of what your actual job role is? We've got a, a little bit broader group than I usually have answers. So that's very cool. I'm super excited. And I love the whole system admin security governance bucket. That's, that's, my, that's my focus, right? I can do the development. I don't go nearly as deep on DAX and M as some other folks out there in the community, right? Um, because I kind of focus a little bit more on everything around um, the, the development piece. The data prep and the modeling, yeah, I have a data warehousing background. So um, that, one's, that one's pretty near and dear to me too. So, okay, well, thanks for that. We'll have a few of those um, as we proceed on. So if we get started at the super 100,000 foot level of Power BI, right? It's a suite of tools. And I start here because when you're talking about Power BI with somebody at work, what you want to be focused on is what do they mean by Power BI? Do they mean the Power BI service? Do they mean Power BI desktop? Do they mean the collection or the entire ecosystem of things that it can do? And when I refer to Power BI generally like that, I'm usually referring to just this broad collection of things. Um, here's a diagram that I mentioned that you would see um, that you can grab from my website as well. And basically what we're going to do throughout this hour is we're going to walk through it, not in extraordinary detail, um, but we're going to walk through some of the important pieces of this. So having just seen it super, super fast, and let me back up a second here. Um, we have data sources on the left. Um, followed by content authoring in the, the second column here. 
Uh, it's being hidden a little bit by my window, but um, we have content delivery, collaboration, and sharing kind of in that center section and system admin uh, to the far right um, with a few related services kind of tucked uh, down there. So in terms of just the breadth, based on your experience level, just curious if, if you're at all surprised that, whoa, there's a lot of stuff there. All right, good. Most people are like, no. It is a it is a deep and a wide offering, that is for sure. Okay, very cool. Well, let's let's move on. And where I want to start is authoring tools and data storage modes. And on the diagram, we're right here uh, towards the left hand side. Let me see if I can. I don't use Zoom a lot. I would like to see if I can just move this thing. It keeps unhiving itself. Eh. All right. So Power BI authoring, you know, fundamentally, we get data from a source. We work in a query editor to prepare it. We create our calculations, our relationships, our data model for the sole purpose of reports and visuals, right? The, the end piece is, is the end goal. So skills wise, there's separate and distinct skills. And there's a couple of different languages, you know, not even counting anything uh, having to do with your source data. Um, we've got the Power Query formula language, if in fact using the ribbon in the query editor um, ends up at some point not being enough. Um, you, can, you can extend it with custom scripts uh, written in M or the Power Query formula language. And then of course there's DAX, which is what all of the calculations and so forth are written in. So even inside the world of just Power BI Desktop, there are a whole lot of skills um, to be learned there. Now, Power BI Desktop is absolutely our tool of choice, right? That's kind of the number one tool that we want to pull out when we're talking about creating in Power BI. But we've actually got a few things in our toolbox, so to speak. So I want to run through what your choices are. And so beyond just Power BI Desktop, there is also Excel, and that's a valid choice. Um, there are uh, add-ins like Power Query, Power uh, Pivot, that are add-ins to Excel that deliver roughly the same functionality, but new features come much, 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 much slower. And of course, the visualization side is very, very different, right? We don't have the equivalent of Power BI reports. Instead, inside Excel, you're using things like pivot tables and pivot charts. And then there's also a thing called Analyze in Excel if you actually wanted to connect to a published data set and, and use those pivot tables and charts without uh, copying the data over again. So Excel is a valid alternative um, to, the, to the desktop tool. The third one listed, we've got a thing called Power BI Paginated Report Builder. Um, if you're at all familiar with reporting services and the RDL type of reports, um, they refer to those as the paginated reports now in this world. And um, that's basically useful when you want to say, hey, the Power BI reports that are usually very dynamic and interactive, that's not what I want. I really want something that's very highly formatted. Now, the fourth one down, Power BI Desktop for Report Server, um, this is the one where if your destination for publishing is intended to be report server instead of Power BI service. And this is one of those cart and horse things here. We haven't talked about those pieces yet, but it's a version of Power BI Desktop that's updated more slowly. So Power BI Desktop gets updates every single month. One landed today. And so everybody on Twitter is um, chit-chatting about um, what, what they like about the, the newest feature release, right? Well, report server, doesn't update itself as often. So, um, in fact, I just saw a Twitter conversation in the last day or two about somebody that um, something wasn't working anymore on report server. And, um, and that's because the, the features need to align. So make sure that you use that special version of the PBIXs 
um, in that situation. And then the last two that deserve mentioning is inside the Power BI service, right? The web-based service where we deploy content. We can actually do some authoring in there too. There's um, dashboards that we create there and you can do some report authoring there too. Though my recommendation is do your report authoring 99.9% .9 of the time in, in the desktop tool if you can. And then the newest kid on the block um, if you've heard of Azure Synapse, so that's kind of the new rebranding of Azure SQL Data Warehouse, plus some extra features. Um, it's getting some integration with Power BI, which is really nice. So you can think of this Azure Synapse Studio tool as being a uh, development tool for that world, but it can connect in to your Power BI workspaces and it's kind of a wrapper to doing some Power BI development work inside of that tool as well. So a few choices that you have there um, for not only what you're gonna use to create your own um, content or what you're gonna deploy to users in your organization and make available on their laptops and so forth. Now data storage modes is one of the most important things um, from, a, from an architecture perspective. And there's, there's four main modes. So the first one is the most common, and it's referred to as import mode, and it's what happens by default if you're not using one of the other ones purposefully. And quite literally, you're importing data into that PBIX file. So you're importing data into the Power BI desktop. When you publish it to the service, the data gets published there too. Um, and that's a really important thing for, um, you know, system administrators and such to realize is that this makes Power BI very different than some other reporting tools that merely issue queries. Now, it can merely issue queries um, by via direct query or live connection mode to where um, you, you just, uh, you essentially there use Power BI as a report only tool and not so much for the data model. There's more to it than that, but at the thousand foot level, that's kind of the story. And then there's the notion of a composite mode where we might have one table in import mode and one um, in say direct query mode. Now this is, um, this combination of import and direct query is available today. The combination of live connection and import is on the release plan. Um, and it's very, very, very important functionality um, that, that is coming. But I won't digress and go too far deep there. So just to kind of restate what we just talked about with data storage modes very briefly, um, import mode, right? Everything is in Power BI. The data and the structure or the schema of the data model. Um, we can work in live connection mode as well. And that would be that I published a PBIX file from Power BI Desktop um, to the service with data in it, and that means that the, the data is now remote, and I can use it from other PBIX files. Now, the two ways that the data remains in the source, if we're working across the second row in the bottom, Oh, there goes my dog. She always has to bark when I'm talking on a webinar every time. Uh, first option is direct query mode. And the section option is also called live connection mode. But in this case, we're talking about getting the data from analysis services instead of a shared data set in the Power BI service. So if it's all a little bit muddy right now, that's okay. What I really want you to take away though is that there are choices and decisions to be made. Um, so at this point, what I would like to know is in your uh, organization and what you've been using thus far, what do you use most often? Melissa? And, oh. Yes, sir. Well, uh, we have a question from Bob. He's asking, is Power BI Server and SSRS the same thing? while we have this. Ooh, that's a great question um and the answer is sort of kind of yes and no um we're actually going to talk about that in the next section but just to answer that question um bob you can think of it as take ssrs plus 
the ability to run Power BI reports and you have Power BI report server. So kind of in addition to the RDLs, we can also publish our Excel files and our PBIX files. And that's the notion. But we'll hit report server, not real deeply or anything, but we'll talk about it a little bit more here in just a few minutes. Uh, okay, so what I would like for you guys to, um, I, I'm not at all surprised that import mode is most, uh, most used. The third one listed there um, is the one that I would like for you, if you're not familiar with what it is, um, to at least investigate it because that is a way that then you have to maintain your data only once and then you have a whole bunch of different Power BI reports just connect into it. And then you're not duplicating data as much. If you've got to update a calculation, you don't have to touch multiple PBI axes and so forth. So um, if, if I had my choice, I'd see the third option there, um, a higher number. Uh, it's one of my favorite issues. I have to bring it up every time I talk about Power BI. Okay, any other questions in there before I uh, move on to our, our three main options for delivering content? Okay, so the biggie, we're gonna start with Power BI service. And so diagram wise, um, we're, we're at the top middle here um, with just a whole, whole bunch of features that, are, that come along with Power BI service. But if we, if we boil it down to what the heck is it, well, let's say I've got one of my three reporting tools. Usually we're talking about Power BI desktop, but it could be any one of these three and I need a place to publish it so that we can start using some of the other features and so forth, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So think of it as a place to where we can collaborate with others on our content and we can allow others to view it as well in a, in a web-based portal is our simplest way to, to start talking about it. Now we've got content, right? We've got dashboards, reports, Excel workbooks, data sets, data flows, all those sorts of things. When we publish to the Power BI service, we can put data in one of two places. It's either my workspace or a workspace. Um, they used to call them app workspaces and they've dropped the app from a prefix. So they're all workspaces. It's just that everyone also has my workspace, which is a private area. Now, once it's been published, there's three ways you can view content. Sharing via the workspace directly or via an app. And I have a whole nother presentation um, that's devoted almost the whole hour <laughs> to which one of these three should you use. So um, there's lots and lots of decisions to be made there. So I'm going to resist the urge to go down a rabbit hole and elaborate too much on this here. But if you don't have a specific plan for how you use each one of those three, sharing workspaces and apps, um, that would be a very important thing to figure out what, what your um, strategy is there. And then the other thing is, out of my workspace, if content has become critical and important, um, used by executives or used by a lot of people, you don't want to share it out of my workspace. That represents risk. You want to get it into a full-fledged workspace, um, which, is, which can be accessed by others, maintained, uh, and so forth. Okay, so that's my super whirlwind uh, uh, tour there. So our objects in the Power BI workspace, we've got data sets, reports, dashboards are an object that are created only up in the Power BI service. And so we can start doing all sorts of interesting things like um, a dashboard uh, is showing charts and objects from multiple reports, a data set's used by many reports. Um, you see you know, the different ways that the arrows go. So I point this out because what the Power BI service gives you is a ton more flexibility than if you are, for instance, getting by with just sharing PBIX files on your file system. That's a very limiting way to use Power BI. It can be done, especially if you've got a really small group, um, but the Power BI service gives you a whole ton more stuff. Now, in order to use it though, 
Um, you do need a user license. You can use my workspace with a free license. Um, anyone who is an author and publishing content for the purpose of others to consume needs a pro license. The retail price is 10 bucks a user per month. Large organizations with buying power from Microsoft get some amount of discount from that. But the idea behind requiring a user license is, well, they have to have your user identity because there's a whole bunch of different security options and that kind of stuff. Now there's this other thing. We're going to talk about Power BI Premium in oh, about 15 minutes. Um, that's another type of license. We call it a dedicated capacity license. And, and we'll talk more about it here in just a bit. Um, but that's your exception to um, the, the needing a pro license for everyone. Um, and, and we'll revisit that um, a little bit more. But in the scenarios where, for instance, you've got 500 salespeople across the world that need a, access to a certain set of reports, they probably don't all need a pro license. You could deploy that content to premium and they can view it via their their free licenses. Um, we'll re revisit that here in just a bit. So your top reasons, just to kind of uh, wrap up the Power BI service whirlwind overview is first, getting you out of sharing and collaboration in Power BI desktop because it's, it's very, very limiting. Um, we've got numerous methods to secure the content and collaboration. Um, not only do we have the, the workspace sharing and apps that we briefly mentioned, you know, we have other, other options um, as well. Um, it's fundamentally friendlier experience, right? It's a web portal, and especially the apps experience um, is, is much friendlier. Row-level security work. So if you need to define row-level security inside your data model, so uh, person A is viewing the same report and they only get to see the east region and person B sees the west region all in the same report because you defined RLS that works up in the Power BI service where it just wouldn't work in, in desktop. And, and the reason that it wouldn't work in desktop is because by virtue of you opening it in desktop, you have edit rights. And if you have edit rights, RLS just goes out the window. It, it's not invoked. So if you're deploying your content in the service in a way that's read only, and there's a couple ways to do that, you can make RLS work. You also get the mobile app because the mobile app will render whatever's been deployed to the service. Um, there's things like comments that you can have conversations um, inside of reports and dashboards, and you can tag coworkers to ask them about something that you're seeing in a report. Um, subscriptions, a second ago when I said there's other ways um, to, to deliver content beyond workspaces and apps and so forth. Things like subscriptions are one of those. Um, the biggest reason that probably pushes people uh, out of Power BI desktop only and up to the service, uh, even if they're just gonna use my workspace, is scheduled data refresh, right? Um, up to eight times a day um, if you're not in premium capacity. Um, we can do alerts, real, real simple alerts in the Power BI service and only on certain, certain kind of measures um, and more integration with Power Automate, which is part of the Power Platform um, uh, to, do, to do other fancy things. Um, I've already hinted at it as well. We can do things like have that centralized data set, um, the shared data set concept. We can also do things like um, certified data sets. So if you can imagine you've published a data set that has been validated by your subject matter expert um, and it's undergone testing and you know this thing is trustworthy, you can set that up as a certified data set and it's a little bit more visible for your report authors. So people that are creating reports but want to use data that's already available. Um, and so it, it makes that a little bit easier to expose data like that. Um, and then we'll talk about data flows more here in a few minutes. But all the work that you do inside of the Power Query Editor, inside of Power BI Desktop, pull that out. Stick it up in the web in uh, uh, Power Query Online, 
and reuse it is, is the crux of data flows. From an admin perspective, we have tenant settings to manage features and user experience um, that, can, that can make a big difference in um, uh, either meeting certain governance or compliance needs or may, maybe even just simplifying and removing confusion for users. Um, and then lastly, an administrator does have visibility into what's actually happening. And so um, uh, understanding usage patterns, understanding who's running what when gives you just a, oh, uh, it's, it's a gold mine of data to understand what's happening in your environment. Um, the next two sections are gonna be fast report server and um, embedding. So let me run through those two very quickly, and then I'm gonna stop and, and we'll see if there's any questions on, you know, kind of the top three delivery modes. So, so sit tight for just a second. Um, so report server is, is depicted down here in the bottom middle. It's got less real estate. Um, it certainly has less features, but I, I don't mean that it's less important than the Power BI service. Now, here we're kind of starting from the same viewpoint, right? I've got three tools. Notice that the top left one is that special Power BI desktop for report server. We want to use the, the, the certain one. And so, okay, we publish any of those up to report server. And initially you might think, yeah, okay, I can collaborate and I can view. You said that about Power BI service too, but it's fundamentally a very, very different thing. This is much more of a simple file and folder based web portal. Um, it doesn't have, you know, a ton of the features that Power BI service has. And that's because the Power BI product team does not have feature parity as a goal for Power BI report server. Um, it is meant to take SQL Server reporting services and add on support for Power BI as well. And that turns it into Power BI report server. So the biggest reasons that you would want to do this is A, you might need an alternative to the Power BI service. Um, that could be your entire organization is not cloud friendly, or it could be that you have maybe one department that says, I do not want to put this content out in a public cloud. I feel more comfortable having it inside of our data center. If you have an existing investment in reporting services, well, that makes PBIRS a whole lot more attractive. And you, the, the idea that it's just simpler and slower is actually just fine and not a downside to you. And you know, it does what you need it to do. So I'm curious of, of those of you that are listening in, who is, who's currently using Report Server? And incidentally, you can use Report Server and the service uh, at the same time. It does mean that users have to visit two different places to find content, but one does not preclude the other. Okay, okay, interesting, all right. So let me talk embedding briefly and, and then we'll stop and, and see what questions you might have so far. So right here is, is where we've depicted embedding kind of right in the middle and there's a number of different ways that you can attack it. So let's talk about this from the perspective first of your normal business author, your subject matter expert. They've done their normal thing. They've created some content in Power BI Desktop and they've published it up to the service in a workspace. Um, same, same thing for them. At this point, the first way that you can attack this is you, you partner then with you know, an IT geek that knows how to work with the JavaScript and REST APIs and turns around and says, okay, that report, I'm gonna turn around and pull it using an API from the Power BI service and you know, 
embed it inside of my application um, inside of an iframe. So then the people that are going to view content are going to do so um, down in the custom app. So this would be kind of the Cadillac of embedding because you've got the whole slew of APIs available to you. Um, but it does take some technical skill to get it done. So there is a simpler approach as well that they call no code embedding. So our starting point here is the same. We've published our content up to the Power BI service. But here, you see I've got my same user here. I'm not going and getting my IT geek. Um, and you just generate, it's, it's on the menu inside the Power BI service. You generate an embed code. And then you go over to whatever um, tool you're using. In this case, I'm, I'm showing SharePoint. Um, and you, you just use that embed code. So um, this, is, this is different than published to web, um, but kind of the same idea in that you've got an embed code that's being exposed somewhere else. So there's a few different ways then that this actually breaks down from a practical perspective. Um, and I, I borrowed this image from white paper. Um, uh, we released, I'm a co-author of this white paper. We released a, an updated one in May. Um, so if you're not familiar with it and you are interested in factors to consider when deploying Power BI, definitely go grab it. I've got a link at the, the end of the slides as well. So from an internal perspective, um, you know, we've got, the Power BI product team refers to it as embed for productivity. Um, this is, um, I want to embed in these kinds of applications that are internal to my company. You doesn't mean you can't have guest users. You certainly can, um, but they're still coming through your Azure Active Directory. So that's why we're calling it internal. We've got embed for your organization, not my term. It's, you know, what, what they made up. Um, here's where we've got the full REST APIs. Under external embedding, we've got the same exact set of REST APIs, but they call this one embed for your customers. And in some of the documentation, you see this um, user owns data and app owns data terminology. Um, the big difference here is, does Power BI know who the user is, right? Um, and then the last one, it is a form of embedding the, the published to web functionality where there's no user authentication. It's absolutely just wide open to the public. Um, and even if you've done that on your internal portal and you think it's secure, I promise you it's not. Um, so anyways, my point in showing you all of this is to make sure that if you are planning to do some embedding, plan to spend some time reading about it because it gets complicated and it's confusing. And then there's also the notion of, hmm, do I need um, dedicated capacity? And the answer, and I know we haven't talked about that yet, but remember we said briefly earlier, if you have dedicated capacity, you can have free users that view this content without having to buy a pro license for everybody. That's why dedicated capacity is talked about in conjunction with embedding a lot. Not because it's an absolute underlying requirement, but because if you're going to expose it through an app, usually it, it uh, is more cost effective. So they, they line up differently. There's a whole lot to it. Um, you know, so I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what the options are. And at this point, I'll ask if any of you are currently using embedding and see uh, if we have any questions at this point. Uh, yeah, so Melissa, there's a couple of questions. The first one comes from Sharar. Uh, when you say act, Azure Active Directory, is this your internal AD or actual Azure AD? I think. Yeah, so it has to be your Azure AD. And what most companies do, um, if they have an an active directory running in your data center is they're just synchronizing all of the identities up to Azure AD, but they do have to truly be up in Azure AD, either created there directly or synchronized there for Power BI to, to do everything that it does. Okay. And uh, one more question. 
is uh, no code embedding. Need a P skew or an A skew? Yeah, so, um, so real quick, uh, tell you what, we're gonna talk premium in a second. Let me answer that after I've actually explained for everybody on the call what in the heck we mean by a P skew. But in general, either one is the short answer, and then we'll we'll elaborate more um, in just a couple of minutes if you'll allow me to explain it in a coherent way. All right, so most people know, but there, you know, we've got some people that are using it, which makes sense. Um, it seems like uh, embedding is is happening more and more. All right, so key components. What I want to do, and especially because I'm running. 10 minutes late uh, is I'm going to just kind of give you a quick introduction to what each one of these are uh, so that we can spend as much of the rest of our time as we can on questions. So on-premises data gateway, this is a really important piece where it's depicted on the diagram is down here uh, on the bottom right. So we have two kinds of gateways. One of them is the good kind. And that's what uh, our standard mode, I still wanna call it the enterprise gateway, but that's an old term. They call it the standard mode now. Or there's a personal mode. And the personal mode is really oriented towards running on your laptop. Um, and I'm going to, to try to convince you to use the standard mode as, as much as you can here. So fundamentally what's happening if you use the standard mode is any of these apps across the top here um, can share a gateway that has been installed you know somewhere that uh, is either inside your corporate network could even be sitting in an Azure VM as long as it can talk to your to your network right so it just has to be able to reach your corporate data sources because really that's the whole point is ah you have some data sources sitting behind your corporate firewall or inside your data center how does power bi communicate with them and it communicates with them through the gateway um, and the standard one these different services across the top can basically share that same uh, installation of the software that's running they don't share the same data sources but they share the same uh, VM where it's, where it's installed. So when do we need a gateway? So this is one of those things that um, ends up being uh, a user help desk issue, right? Uh, somebody has been working in Power BI desktop, uh, everything's fine, they go and they publish and oops, it doesn't refresh or whatever. And a lot of times that's because a gateway is needed. So after it's published to the Power BI service, you need it if you are refreshing an imported data set or data flow, if you're using direct query, or live connection. And that data source that you're trying to reach is sitting on-prem or sitting inside of um, uh, uh, so I should rephrase this. So by cloud-based IaaS here, what I mean is a virtual machine that is sitting in, you know, Azure or whatever. Um, by cloud-based PaaS, I mean something like Azure SQL Database, which has been added to a virtual network. So the reason that I, I want you to, um, to really note that is because sometimes the documentation is written very briefly and it says, oh, if you're reaching data in, uh, in an Azure cloud database or say Azure SQL database, you don't need a gateway. And that's not always true. Depends on how the database is configured with regard to its network. And there is also certain functionality that you use that then turns around and requires a gateway to be invoked. So I got both of these from Chris Webb. Um, so it's not an all-inclusive list, but there are certain things where that brings it up. So the two modes, the, the standard mode, your admin 
the gateway admin is responsible for managing it and it's used by many users. Whereas the personal mode, it can only do refresh, it can only do Power BI, can't do all those um, other services and so forth. Now, the, the kicker with the standard mode is this notion of each data source has to be explicitly configured. So there's kind of another help desk potential thing. What I mean by that is, let's say you've installed a gateway cluster, and it can be a cluster, by the way, of say, two or three machines, so you can do high availability, you know, DR, HA, that kind of stuff. You register data sources to it, so maybe data source one is a SQL server, maybe data source two is an Oracle database, you get the idea. And then there are users defined for each one of these data source. Each user is who's allowed to connect through that data source to reach the underlying data. So depending on how you configure it, um, that's either saved credentials or it's, or it's gonna pass through the, the identity. But I mention that because if you're not on the user list for the data source, you're not gonna find it, you're not gonna be able to use it once your content's been published. So um, definitely something that requires continuous management and oversight. Um, and there's also a number of different spots where you manage things. Um, I've got another uh, pub, uh, presentation on Power BI administration where I talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail. So if you're interested in this piece, you might, you might check that one out. So premium. All right, so we, we said a couple minutes ago that we need to cover this. So premium is part of the Power BI service. And what's happening with premium? So if we don't have premium, when we have content up in the service, our workspaces are sitting in what's called shared capacity, right? It's Microsoft servers behind the scenes that are serving up the content. When you've bought your own capacity, you're buying your own level of dedicated CPU, memory, that kind of thing. So then what you do is you sign workspaces to that specific capacity um, in order to then get those benefits. So you might have 10 workspaces in play and only two of them are, are added to dedicated capacity, or maybe all of them are. So the top reason, as, as we mentioned earlier, for, for using premium is the idea of cost effectiveness, right? Um, the, the, the ability to have free users that are viewers only view the content that's sitting in a workspace that's been added to uh, premium capacity. But there's also other features. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty new thing called deployment pipelines um, that is a premium only feature. So if you've got, say, a development workspace and a production workspace, um, it, it helps you uh, with deploying there. You get more features for data flows. Um, you get this thing called XMLA read write. Um, you've got some extra features with the near real time reporting, this very cool thing that does change detection. You can publish paginated reports to the Power BI service. So earlier, when I was talking about the uh, Power BI paginated report builder tool, um, that's the tool that you would use to publish an RDL type of report to the service. Um, you get more integration with things like cognitive services and machine learning. More frequent data refreshes, it goes from eight per day for a data set up to up to 48. Large data sets is a very big deal. So in shared capacity, you have a limit of one gig compressed for a single data set for 10 gig total in a workspace. So one gig compressed in the columnar structure that it is compresses very nicely 
But if you're going to start using shared data sets and if you're going to certify them and reuse them for a whole bunch of different reports, that data set might grow larger. And, and so that scalability is, is really important. Um, uh, IT and, and compliance departments might have a, a need for saying, we want to run on our own dedicated hardware instead of um, hardware that is shared with other customers. Now, it's still secure when you're in shared capacity, um, but it's just shared hardware as opposed to premium is not. Um, and then you get other things like managing your own encryption key if you want to, or saying, I want to ensure that my data is stored exactly in this country and it does not leave the borders of that country. Um, and that would be set for a specific uh, Power BI premium capacity that you bought and it would apply to the workspaces and the data applied to that capacity. So that lets you do that even if your Power BI home tenant sits elsewhere. And then here's the odd one. You get Power BI report server as an alternative. They just if you if you get uh, you know whatever the the V cores the the number of cores that come along with what you bought for premium, you just get Report Server as an as an extra if you want to use it. Now I want to address the question that came in earlier about um, uh, about premium or embedded. So. When you buy Power BI Premium, you have either a monthly or an annual commitment, and the, the minimum retail anyways price is $5,000 per month for the first level of Power BI Premium. Now, um, the alternative is you buy capacity, this dedicated capacity in a different way through Power BI Embedded. Um, it's just a service um, in Azure, and I have a uh, uh, my SKU level is an A4, which an A4 in Power BI Embedded is equivalent to a P1 in premium as far as CPU and memory and so forth. So anyways, my, my point is, is that once you have purchased it and you have told Power BI through either one of these, let me, let me back up a second here. There's two pages here, premium and embedded. So I don't have anything in premium because this is my demo tenant and quite obviously I am, as an individual who demos Power BI, I'm not going to pay $5,000 a month. But for embedded, um, that is a, is a very different thing because it's, um, it's more of a platform as a service and what, happens when you don't need it is you can pause it. You can schedule it to be paused and, uh, and started whenever you need it. Whereas when you purchase premium, it runs 24 seven and it's not really intended to scale up and down and so forth. And so um, in the white paper, we, we rewrote the premium section to basically talk a little bit more about when would you use premium when would you choose Power BI Embedded? If you're going to run it 24-7, Power BI Embedded actually ends up being a little bit more costly. Um, but you do have the flexibility to just, you know, change it anytime you need it. So um, as long, once you've exposed it to Power BI, it doesn't care where the dedicated capacity came from. It just cares how much did you buy and you configure your workloads. Right, um, you know, you've got a number of different settings here that you can control. Um, you assign your workspaces and so forth. So hopefully that answers that question. So I'm curious um, about who's using premium now. Melissa, we have a question from Wim. Is okay. it 10 gigabyte per workspace or per tenant in the pro subscription? Um, it's technically, it, the, the documentation's changed a couple times because it gets confusing. Um, it's per user. So basically across an entire tenant, if you have um, 10 users times 10 gig, that's kind of your 
your overall uh, limit inside of your tenant. So um, generally speaking though, um, it, a lot of times it's phrased as 10 gig of workspace, but that's not technically uh, imposed by, by the service, if you know what I mean. So it's more of a, more of a user thing. But those limits go dramatically up once you purchase premium. Uh, okay, interesting, no identified need. Um, and then I love the last one. I, I usually see uh, a few people saying, yep, we'd like it, but okay, good deal. All right, data flows. So um, data flows are uh, depicted up here in the service. Um, kind of right there. So this is the same diagram that you saw earlier with a data flow added to the bottom. So the first thing to know about a data flow is that it does not negate the need for a data set, right? The data set is your data model that the reports rely upon. So a data flow is more about Ah, I want to do the data preparation once um, and reuse it among multiple data sets. So in this case, data set one and two are getting some data from the same data flow. And so um, a data flow is created inside of Power Query Online. So up in the Power BI service, um, we will do that work instead of inside the query editor inside of uh, Power BI Desktop. So Basically then Power BI Desktop points to the data flow as a source and then continues the, the rest of the entire process about creating a data model, um, creating calculations, creating reports is all exactly the same. It's all about um, the query editor and just reusing that functionality. So the biggest reasons why you would want to start using data flows are this idea of self-service data cleansing and preparation that is um, uh, uh, reusable. So less repetitive work by different, different people or even yourself, if you find yourself kind of doing the same thing um, in multiple PBIX files. And then maybe you've got some standardized consistent data. So um, my favorite examples of this are, uh, you know, maybe you've got a date dimension or table. Maybe you've got a, a standard customer table that lots and lots and lots of PBIX files are going to use it, expose it as a data flow, and then let those authors, they don't have to do the work to, um, to go get it from a source system or maybe even go get it from an underlying data warehouse. Because um, the data flow can do some of that prep and you want to do as much as you can in the data flow, right? All the nice friendly names, all the data types um, as much as you can so that by the time it hits a data set, people can customize it if they need to, but they don't have to do any more cleanup. And then the third big thing is reducing a load sent to a source system. So if you have a very picky source system that maybe you can only query it, um, you know, certain time of day, or you can't send very many queries, that's a great scenario for a data flow because only the data flow is going to go query it from the source system when it refreshes its data. And then the data sets, when they need to refresh, they'll run, they'll only hit the data flow. So you can relieve some load off of your source system if you need to. Um, so who's, who's using data flows? They've, they've been one of the younger features. Um, that has been slowly but surely maturing. Cool, cool. Um, the other aspect to data flows that, that we haven't talked about yet is um, beneath the data flow, the data is actually sitting in a service called Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. And so um, one of the considerations that you're going to need to make is um, do you, uh, if you just use data flows and you don't do anything specific, 
the data is still sitting in that service as your data lake, but you don't know it. It's just you know, happening behind the scenes, like everything else in Power BI, right? We don't actually know, we don't see the data storage layer, right? Um, or you can associate a specific data lake account um, to, to specify where that data sits. And then if you wanted to access that data through other tools as well, and not just Power BI, you can, you can do that as well. All right, so last little bit, it looks big, but we're going we're gonna to blow through this pretty fast. So we've got integration with, um, you know, Microsoft 365 in a, a whole bunch of ways. And this is only getting more and more and more. So um, I, I think we're going to see lots and lots more integration points keep coming up because I think um, the way I understand it, Microsoft wants to make it as easy as possible for people to use the tools and use the tools wherever they happen to be. So um, Teams and Power BI integration, for instance, has been getting better and better. Um, the Power Platform. So we've already got lots of integration between Power Automate and Power Apps um, and lots and lots of very cool things that can be done uh, between all of those. And Azure. Lots and lots of scenarios. Um, we talked just a bit about Power BI Embedded and the A-series SKUs as an alternative to premium. Um, Azure Data Lake Storage is, is the data flow storage. Um, if, you, if you do a premium and you have enabled what they call large data sets, um, those are stored in a service called Azure Premium Files. So, um, so there's that. And then there's some of these other services that are invoked depending on, on what you're doing. Um, from a security and governance perspective, um, you know, Cloud App Security has some really cool stuff. Um, I posted a video on that not too long ago. Um, Microsoft Information Protection is what we use for sensitivity labels in the Power BI service. Um, there's also some, some Key Vault uh, integration a little bit. And Intune, so there's the, the Power BI mobile app. So if your IT folks want to manage that, they can, they can do so through, through Intune. Um, and then from an automation perspective, there's a whole set of uh, PowerShell commandlets and REST APIs to start pulling data out um, and working with it. Um, lots and lots of scenarios here that can, that can happen um, you can even manage some of your data directly through APIs. Um, one example of that might be, oh, our data warehouse refreshed, finished at, say, 4 a.m. I want to use an API to kick off uh, refreshing some of my most important Power BI files. So rather than scheduling them in the service, you can kick off an, an API to do that. Um, and then you can also pull lots and lots of data out um, with those as well. So. Huge topic there. All right, so um, we did a super fast flyby uh, kind of walkthrough of, of this end to end. Um, before we open it up to Q and A, um, I just wanted to remind you where the uh, URLs are to more information, uh, plus blog and videos. Uh, is is some extra stuff if you want to grab them. Here's a link to that white paper that I mentioned earlier that has lots and lots of good stuff. Um, uh, it's up to like, I don't know, 200 and some pages now. It's a beast. Um, if you're not familiar with the roadmap, this is huge. Visit these pages. Um, this is where you can plan for what's coming. Um, the service health, the Power BI blog, that kind of stuff. I'm sure you guys absolutely know that all of those exist. Uh, let me leave this one up in case anybody needs it. And we can see if you have any further questions. All right, so this is how we're gonna handle Q&A. Uh, okay. If you have a question, type in chat that you have a question with your name and then I will call you and you can unmute your mic and ask direct, list a direct question, okay? So if anybody have a question, go ahead. Okay, Sharar, go ahead, unmute and ask your question. 
Hello, thank you for the presentation. Hello, you're welcome. I have a question for you. So I understand everything Azure, 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 but what if, you know, there's other cloud providers and I live in AWS, what do I do? Because we're not going to Azure ever. What what are solutions for me? If, if they're none, which is fine, but uh, I'm just curious. Well, are you using the Power BI service at all? Because I guess- No, but, but let's say, you know, some of our users come to us saying, hey, we want to do this. And I'm like, well, uh, it's all embedded into Azure. And as a, a company, we have an agreement with AWS and we're there for the long haul. So gotcha. I'm just curious, what, what would I, what would be an answer I can give that like, I'm sorry, no, because you have to be in the Azure ecosystem? Yeah, so Power BI Report Server runs on a virtual machine, wherever you want to put it. So that could be one answer is, you know, it's running in your AWS environment. A user uses Power BI Desktop, the, the, the one that's specially for Report Server, and when they publish it, the destination is your VM sitting in, in AWS. So that would, that would be the most obvious route that I can think of that keeps you out of Azure services. I'm not saying I don't want to be in Azure. It's just- Oh, sure, sure, sure. Thing. But what about yeah, the Active Directory integration, given that that's kind of, t I asked that question earlier about the, the Active Directory. If it's Azure Active Directory and we just have Active Directory, for ourselves, what's the end? Would that be something you have to worry about as far as the publishing, all that stuff? If we're using yeah, Report Server, yeah, I think Report Server. Then you're you're bound more than towards um, just integrating with AD to your Report Server, and you don't have to worry about AAD in that case. So, so yeah, that's Power BI service that is joined at the hip with AAD. Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else? So you're gonna make, else? Me make oh. a, an on the fly change, I just said, or another cloud provider. So, so see, there you go. You just improved my, my materials. So actually I have a question. Um, okay. I've been investigating a possibility of, so we have some Power BI report. So I use Power BI report server. Uh, for okay. it lives in a SQL server inside our uh, environment. And I found out that you could actually deploy some of these report uh, directly into Teams. So we have Teams channels. So I created some reports that provided kind of statistic for our servers, like our SQL server, our Windows server, all that kind of stuff. So we want to be able to deploy that, you know, kind of a, like every day when it's updated, we want to be able to like, oh, automatically post it to a Teams channel type of thing. Is that part of the uh, premium service that you sh that I think it shows that embedded to Teams section? Is that so? The the integration with Teams and Power BI, the way I understand it, it can talk to the Power BI service and it's not a premium feature. Now, what I don't know off the top of my head is out of report server, how you would integrate with Teams. I'm not saying there isn't a way. Oh, um, no, I think- But I just we, don't know. Yeah, we, we know for sure that we're gonna have to go to Power BI, uh, the, the online one, the- Oh, okay. Yeah, we know that. Oh, and okay. Just, I was just wondering if is that what you meant by the embedded, the embed? Oh uh, yeah, here. So, um, let me think. Do I have? Do I have? Do I have? Do I have? I didn't fire up my other VM that I would want. But hang on, let me see. Back. Uh, it doesn't matter what I. There is this guy here, share to teams. And then 
there is also these pieces here, um, which you wouldn't need. Ignore that though. Um, you wouldn't need because you know they're making the the share to teams much more uh, much more visible. But that whole no code embedding that I was talking about right, before, right. Mm -hmm. that this is kind of where they've got that piece to just generate the embed code. Um, but this other one, you're just specifying, hey, here's my, you know, here's my team's channel and, you know, that kind of stuff. Is there, is, uh, is there a way to like automate that, for example, every Monday morning or every, once a day to kind of post uh, like kind of create an entry in Teams, you know, like uh, as a kind of like a chat entry. Oh, or, okay. Oh. So the I I would see it as two pieces. Then is one okay. you do the pair, and then it's just always pinned to a page. Yeah, yeah. In Teams, so that part's yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, Power Automate. Okay. I think would be your um, option for um, when this report refreshes. Uh, or on the schedule that you're saying, right? Might not right. be the same thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, post a chat message in Teams um, in this channel. And that's absolutely something you could do with Power. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any question? Well, I want to say thank you for Scott for answering some of the question on chat too. Uh, Scott oh, Stauffer yeah. is here. Yeah, I know he's uh he's been trying to help answer some question. Um, Excellent, I appreciate it. And, and, okay, uh, do you have anything else, Melissa? You want to share with us? I don't. So thank you for the invitation, and uh, hopefully one day we'll get to see you in in person <laughs> yeah for sure definitely we're 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 looking forward to the end of this whole situation right hopefully we, we get out healthy and um so i am gonna open the oh actually there's one more question okay uh, can power bi be used without ad uh no, active it directory. has to have Azure Active Directory. Has yes. to. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. Okay. There you go. Does that answer your question, Dan? Dan? Uh, okay, so if you got anybody in here has a, uh, anything they want to share with the group, job posting, uh, looking for a job or any other messages? Oh, Dan says not AAD, but AD. Oh, you don't need AD. So like yeah. I run my whole demo environment on just Azure Active Directory. Uh, I and I, I don't have a regular AD. So uh, Dan, I think uh, if you're asking about the Power BI online, which is the the service, the online service, then I think it's Azure Active Directory. But if you do uh, like what what I did is internals, just Power BI report server, we do, we still use our AD uh, to at least to authenticate people to view the report, right? Yeah, so, and report server is very, very, very ingrained in Kerberos, right? Ex exactly, yes, and it's part of you know SQL Server or so. No. Not the service is much smaller system. Dan, you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Maybe that would be easier. <laughs> okay. Would you like to? Got it. There you go. Go ahead. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> Ours are very small systems. Uh, imagine a brewery that uh, doesn't have a very large budget, and we just mm -hmm. want to show them some reporting. And, but they don't yet know what the reports are that they want. That we might have a handful of reports, half a dozen reports, and a reporting an SSRS server. Uh, but we want the ability to add some ad hoc kind of visualizations a la Grafana, Tableau, or Power BI. And we'd like to stick within the Microsoft family. Okay. 
So then I think you're talking about starting with just Power BI Desktop, right? Yeah. And, uh -huh. you know, that's absolutely free. And yep. as far as, you know, the, the Azure AD thing, really you just need credentials into whatever data source you're, you're querying and, and grabbing yep. data. And it'll be a SQL right? Server. Okay. Yep. So then you say, hey, I've got something that uh, I have finished or whatever, and I want to share with other people. Um, you know, if, if, like you said, it's a very small organization, if you do the Power BI service, you're talking $10 a user per month, which um, for a small organization isn't too bad. Um, or in, if they already they also, have... Sorry. Hmm? Wouldn't they also need to have an Office 365 subscription? So that gets so tricky. Technically, no, but everything is not going to work quite as beautifully. <laughs> right. Um, okay. But yep. technically, no, that's not an absolute prerequisite, but I can't say I've ever tried it without. Got it. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Dan. To, to do some simple re to do some simple reporting, it's basically buy once, like SSRS. But to do serious visualizations, it's subscription. Um. So, I, not per se. So the Power BI uh, desktop that's built in for that's that comes for the report server has visualization yeah. built in but there if you want custom visualization or other visualization that people made you have to go to the marketplace and download then you need premium for that melissa i think that's pretty sure that's uh, no 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 you don't need premium to oh. Custom videos. oh you don't okay so there are some that that's not there but yeah you you can use that and uh okay sure, i yeah. guess it's time to do some homework now there, there you go <laughs> thank you very much yeah, yeah, and don't forget that in, in the Power BI service, my workspace is free. So if you have just one person that wants to evaluate, okay, once I get this up here, how does it look? How does it render? How can I schedule refresh, right? You don't get, yep. you don't get absolutely everything, right? You don't get subscriptions and, and other workspaces and such, but you know, you, you could do a, a, a little bit of, of um, uh, help them do a bit of evaluation. Okay. On a, on a small budget. We'll give it a go. Awesome. Well, good luck.